Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Christy Sullivan. I'm the secretary of the American Society for Cellular and Computational Toxicology. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar, which we have every now and again. We have a, a webinar related to uh, methods or policy um, advances related to cellular and computational toxicology. If you uh, would like to give a webinar or request a webinar uh, topic, please feel free to let me know. And I also wanted to let you know about our sixth annual meeting. It's going to be this fall, this time in the Washington, D.C. area in September. Uh, you can go to this uh, website here, the annual meeting website, and find out more information, uh, including abstract submission uh, information. July 1st is the deadline. And this year we're focusing on two different areas. One is acute systemic toxicity and both uh, research advances and um, policy changes related to uh, that endpoint. We'll have two speakers and then hopefully some uh, ab um, talks from submitted abstracts in that session. And we also have a poster reception, a, uh, an award ceremony, and one of the things that we've tried to do in the past couple of years is really uh, encourage the participation of young scientists and students. And we'll have a couple of different mentoring activities. So if you're interested in being a mentor or a mentee, or you have students who might be, then uh, feel free to find out more information on the website. And the second day, we're going to focus on the new Lautenberg Act, which passed last year. And that is uh, a, a bill, if you don't know, it's, a, it's a, a law that governs EPA's regulation of industrial chemicals. And so we're going to have uh, Gino Scarano from EPA providing a presentation. One of the one of the requirements of the law is that EPA come up with a strategic plan to reduce, refine, and replace the use of vertebrate animals. And so, uh, Gino will be talking about that, uh, and then we're going to have about an hour and a half to provide lots of stakeholder discussion and input uh, with EPA. And so that should be a very interesting session. Um, how, how the meeting works is that we take uh, abstracts and then the oral talks are chosen from those. Usually we accept poster abstracts after the July 1st deadline, uh, but it depends on space. So uh, hopefully you will join us for that meeting or tell your colleagues to as well. So a couple of quick things about this webinar. It is recorded. Uh, ASCCT members are um, able to view a recording of the webinar on our website after the, the event. And I hope you'll visit our website to find out more about the society if you're not a member. So today we have Johanna Niffler giving a presentation. Johanna obtained a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a master's degree in genetics in Switzerland. She then joined the Leis lab at the University of Kunstanz, Germany as a PhD student to develop in vitro assays for developmental neurotoxicity. Her PhD project was to develop a migration assay of human neural crest cells. And so she will present these results in this talk. Um, I forgot to mention just quickly that um, um, uh, to ask a question after the presentation is finished, you'll be able to put your question in the question feature down below. Um, if uh, you can actually ask a question at any time, just put it down in the, in the question feature and we'll be able to uh, answer it at the end. I'm 
Okay. Sorry, I'm having a little te technical difficulty here, but jo Johanna, I've just given you presenter rights, so you should be able to show your screen. Um, yes. So do you see my screen? Uh, I did for a moment and then... Then it went away. Okay, just try it again. Can you now see it? No. Hmm. How does it come? Um, ah, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One has to press play. That was not uh, clear to me. Ah. So. Okay. Well, we're ready. Now. <laughs> So oh, I, I also like uh, to welcome all the participants to my presentation. It has the title Combination of Multiple Neural Crest Migration Assays to Identify Environmental Toxicants from a Proof of Concept Chemical Library. Um, I divided this talk into three parts. So I will start with a short introduction about neural crest cells. Uh, in the second part, I will shortly describe how we developed the assay to make it suitable for high throughput. And then in the third part, the largest part, um, I will explain how we screened the compound library. So neural crest cells are a very specialized cell type that arises at the during early neural development at the time where the neural plate is formed, and then here. The neural tube. Here at the edge, uh, neural crest cells are formed. They then delaminate from the neural tube, migrate to different places uh, in the embryo, and give rise to very various cell types. For example, neurons, enteric neurons, and sensory neurons, but also cartilage and bone of the head region, or for example, melanocytes. If neural crest cells do not properly function, this leads to so-called neurochristopathies. If uh, there is a disorder where neural crest cell migration is compromised in um, the migration of enteric uh, neural crest cells, and this leads to um, the fact that enteric neurons are missing, and this is called Hirschsprung's disease. Um, the disease that is uh, caused by mutation in certain genes there is also another uh, neurochristopathy that occurs when proliferation of cranial neural crest cells is disturbed. And in that case, um, um, the, the bones of the head cannot properly be formed, and this leads to craniofacial malformation, and it's called Treacher Collins syndrome. And actually, similar to that syndrome, there are craniofacial malformations that can be um, occurring upon toxicant exposure, for example, by treatment with retinoic acid to treat acne or other compounds. So we wanted actually to establish a test system to screen toxicants for effects on neural crest cell migration and to understand the mechanisms. And for this purpose, we first had to generate neural crest cells. So in our lab, we generate neural crest cells from human pluripotent stem cells by differentiating them via a ROSET stage. You can see here ROSET that we then um, FAC sort for neural crest markers. And then we obtain um, neural crest cells that we can expand and freeze large batch, batches of them that we can then use further for the experiment. So actually the protocol looks uh, more or less like this. And the important thing to remember is that it takes seven weeks. So it's really a long protocol. 
um, it has some difficult steps and this makes that the cells are very precious. So the goal now um, of my project was actually to develop such a high throughput assay. And what we actually already had was a lower throughput assay that we call MINK assay. It has already been published years ago. And in that assay, actually, it's a typical wound healing assay where there is a confluent layer of cells. And then using a pipette tip, um, one introduces a scratch to obtain a cell-free area. And then cells migrate um, into it. And um, one can then uh, count the number of migrated cells. The problem of this assay is actually that it has rather a low throughput. And then also this introduction of the scratches is yeah, it's quite difficult and needs some training. And these scratches then have different widths, which um, leads to variation among experiments and within experiments. And also because the scratches are not always at the same position, um, one has to acquire the image manually. And what we now actually wanted uh, to have now was a higher throughput assay that is experimenter independent. And for this, we use uh, this silicon tools here that we call silicon stoppers. They introduce a round cell-free area that is always of the same size. So we don't have variation in the cell-free, in the size of the cell-free area. It's very simple to handle. Bachelor students can do it. And um, the best part is that we actually can use automated image acquisition. And this, of course, uh, increases throughput. So in the first results part, I will now show you how we developed the assay. And this is actually, um, we have published this earlier this year in the journal Altex. You can freely access it if you want to know the details. So as I've already explained before, um, we use these silicon stoppers here in gray. And we introduce them to the 96 well plate before we see the cells. So when we add the cells, um, they cannot attach to the circular area in the middle. After one day, we remove the stoppers and the cells can then start to migrate and populate this area. And they do so within two days. After two days, we live, uh, live stain the cells and um, take pictures of this migration zone to quantify cell migration. We also take pictures of the outer part of the well to assess general cell viability. And in both cases, we actually count number of cells. So here is an example. It's the quarter of a migration zone. And you can see many migrating cells here in green for the control condition. And if we treat it with a migration inhibitor, we see much less migrated cells. We can also um, obtain concentration response curves. We always normalize them to the untreated control, which is set at 100%. And you can see in gray um, cell viability and here in purple cell migration. And what is important is actually that here we have a concentration that we consider cytotoxic because um, viability is below 90%. This uh, line here in the middle is the 90% line. And this is um, a concentration we are not interested in. But what we are interested in is actually a co a concentrations that do not affect viability, but strongly reduce migration. And so here we would say that this compound has a specific effect on migration. So we started um, to set up um, the assay using different kind of controls. And so we started with an assay setup that was very similar to the scratch assay we had before, um, where cells are treated for 48 hours with um, the toxicant. And so we tested endpoint specific control. So in this case, um, a microtubule inhibitor. And we saw nice um, concentration dependent effect and migration inhibition. However, when we tested a known uh, neurocrest cell migration inhibitor, in that case cadmium chloride, um, we did not see um, such a specific effect on migration. And this means actually that the assay in the current form is not suitable to detect neurocrest cell migration inhibitors. So we saw that how we could solve that problem and one idea was 
to shorten the toxic and the exposure time with the idea that maybe we would get similar effects on migration, but we would reduce cytotoxicity and therefore um, get a better window. So we adapted the assay and treated the cells only for 24 hours with the toxicant. So our endpoint specific control worked more or less the same way than in the 48 hour setup. And now with this new um, setting, we also saw a specific effect of the known positive compound. So we are now actually sure that with this 24 hour setup, we are able to detect specific neurocrest cell migration inhibition. So we now could go on and test some new compounds. And so among the new, new compounds, we found compounds that specifically affected neural crest cell migration. For example, here, retinoic acid, as I've said before, it's a known uh, neural crest cell toxicant in vivo. We also found unspecific compounds. So that are comp these are compounds that um, do only affect migration at concentrations where also viability is compromised. So for example, here we see 50% migration inhibition, but also at the same concentration, 50% decrease in viability. And so we consider these compounds as unspecific toxicants. We also observed, and that was a bit worrying, um, that proliferation inhibitors also can reduce migration here to some extent. And so we were worrying that our that when we want to measure migration, we actually also measure proliferation or inhibition of proliferation. And so we had a closer look at it and we tested um, several compounds at a, at con at a, at a certain concentration and measured always the amount of migration relative to the control and the amount of proliferation relative to the control. And when we measured several compounds, we found that they actually form three different groups. So here in the top, we have a group of compounds that do not disturb migration, but affect proliferation to various extent. They are not a problem in our assay. Then we have here a group of compounds that strongly reduce migration, um, but do not disturb proliferation. And we would consider them as through migration inhibitors, we know that what we see in the assay comes from migration inhibition. However, here in the middle, we have a group um, that at the same time um, disturbs migration and inhibits proliferation. And unfortunately, most of our toxicants we are very interested in fall into that group. And so we cannot 100% be sure if we measure really migration inhibition in the assay. So we decided to repeat the migration assay um, at, in, under the presence of a proliferation inhibitor and normalize the data to this proliferation inhibitor. And we could then see that actually all the compounds did still inhibit migration, but often at a little higher concentration. But after this, uh, this data now, we know that um, our assay is able to or that, that these are true migration inhibitors and that our assay is suitable to measure migration. Maybe you also realize that um, the red group and the blue group is more or less separating at 75% um, of migration. So that is also something, yeah, kind of a threshold that we take into account. Because now we wanted to set up a prediction model. So um, in previous um, studies from other groups and from our groups, um, where two endpoints were measured, um, people used to compare the EC50 of viability with the EC50 of their other um, readout and use this as a measure for um, uh, to say whether the compound is specific. However, um, when we applied this scenario in, in the migration assay, it did not help us to separate the positive compounds from the unspecific compounds. So we tried some different options. So we came up with um, one option described here. 
So we compare the EC90 of viability, so the border of cytotoxicity, with the EC75 of migration, so the border, the threshold where we consider that migration inhibition starts. And this gives us kind of an information about how much these two curves separate, so kind of a measure for specificity. And when we use this strategy, we actually could separate the positive compound from the unspecific compound. We also have a third um, prediction model um, that gives us rather information about efficacy. So in that case, we measure the amount of migration inhibition at the EC90 of viability. And also this model allows us to separate the unspecific compounds from the positive compounds. But to summarize it, we actually can say that we consider a compound as migration inhibiting if we find um, if we find concentrations where viability is above 90%, but migration is below 75%. So here I come to the end of this um, second part. So I showed you that the new seeming assay has several advantages. So it is more experimental independent, easier to handle. Um, we can acquire the image um, automatically, and we also develop the software for automated image analysis. And all in all, this gives us a medium to high throughput. We've seen that a shorter exposure time leads to a higher sensitivity of the assay. And we tested a broad set of compounds, tool compounds, positive controls, negative controls, and so on. And we paid a special focus on proliferation, and in the end, we could set up a preliminary prediction model. And now we can move on to the screening. I will just quickly um, switch, switch off and on my screen because my computer said that there is a problem. So I hope now that it will work again for the rest of the talk. So in this third part, I will describe how we did the screening, so the strategy, which different steps we, we did. And actually, all that work is now in press in Archives of Toxicology. And in case you want to know the details, but you cannot access um, the publication, you can contact me by email. I can send you a copy. So we wanted to test um, our migration assay in a smaller screening to see whether it is suitable. And we decided to test um, an 80 compound library that is called NTP80 list because we obtained it from the National Toxicology Program. And it contains actually 75 compounds because there are five duplicate compounds. So there are several flame returns, um, pesticides, drug-like compounds, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, few industrial chemicals and five negative controls in that library. And so, because as I said before, the neural crest cells are quite precious, we chose a tired testing strategy. So we started to screen all 80 compounds in the migration assay at only one single concentration and, and find the potential positive hit compounds. For these compounds then, we obtained concentration response curves and um, checked again whether they really inhibit migration and um, obtained there the positive hits. And using these positive hits, we then did several kind of follow-up essays. So in more detail, actually, um, we started to test each compound at the highest concentration in the library. That was usually 20 micromolar. And we first tested um, the viability in the normal migration assay setup. And if, my, if viability was compromised, we reduced the concentration and repeated the assay again until we found a concentration that was not cytotoxic. But for most of the concentration, the, uh, for most of the compounds, the highest concentration was not cytotoxic anyway. When we found such a um, non-cytotoxic concentration, we then performed the migration assay in three biological replicates using that concentration. 
we then checked um, whether we found migration inhibition and we decided to use less stringent condition than our normal prediction model. So we required only a migration inhibition of 20%. If this was not the case, we considered the compound as negative. All other compounds were um, defined as potential positive hits and we reordered all these compounds, diluted them and went on to the HIT confirmation testing, where we obtained concentration response curves, again, in three biological replicates. Um, after that phase, we um, checked for migration inhibition, and this time we used our normal criteria, our standard prediction model, and would, would exclude or would define compounds as negative that would not meet that criteria. And all other compounds we then consider as positive hits. And with these positive hits, we then did three kind of follow-up assays. So we retested them in absence of proliferation. We um, measured single cell speed and we performed a different migration assay, a transfer assay. And in the next minutes, I will um, guide you through the results of the different um, parts. So I start, of course, with the screening. So we screened these 80 compounds or 75 compounds and found surprisingly 26 potential positive compounds. So here I've ordered them from the most, migra uh, on top is the most migration inhibiting compound and on the bottom are the least uh, migration inhibiting compounds. And so we saw 26 potential positive compounds. You can already see that, for example, PAH are rather in the bottom part of the graph and flame returns are rather on the top. And so not all chemical classes um, are evenly distributed. But I will not um, spend too much time on this um, screening part. I will right move on to the hit confirmation phase. And so the nice thing is actually that we could confirm 23 of the 26 compounds from the screening. And on the right, you see a, a table with um, all the compounds ordered by their chemical class. And, and the ones that are highlighted in color are the ones that were confirmed in the heat confirmation phase. And so you can actually see that most flame returns were identified as um, positive compounds, several pesticides, several drug-like compounds, but no negative controls, no industrial chemicals, and no PAH. So actually all the hits fall into only three chemical classes. We also checked our results for some kind of, or we did some kind of consistency checks with our results. So for example, we could see that all negative controls were also negative, which is of course nice. Then there were, as I've said, five duplicate compounds in the library. They actually also, um, the, the, the two duplicates also gave always similar results. So that was also was an indication that the assay works reliably. What we can then see more is that, for example, um, PB, for PBDAs, we picked up all three compounds that were in the library. Or, yeah, we can see for kind of chemical consistency. In the group of organophosphate flame returns, we picked up six of the eight compounds. And actually these six compounds all have an aromatic side chain, whereas the two negative ones have aliphatic side chain. So this indicates that there is kind of a special structure that um, correlates with migration inhibition. And this gives us more confidence that, that our assay does not give some random results. We also found that actually among the positive hits are many halogenated compounds, chlorinated and brominated ones, and also many organophosphates. And here are two examples of organochlorine compounds, so the pesticides DDT and dieldrin, that really strongly reduce migration, but rather at higher concentration. So we then wanted to compare um, these results with um, data already available. And so 
we decided to compare the EC90 of viability and the EC75 of migration. In, it's displayed in purple to data um, that have already been published by Ryan et al. 2016. They have um, tested this library in a new right outdoor screening. And we also compared them to a data available from the TOX21 assay database, so nuclear receptor assays and similar. And so um, from here are the, the 23 confirmed hits. And we, I indicated here the, the potency of the compounds. And from this graph, you actually can see several interesting things. So for example, here um, for colchicine, you can see that First of all, it's a very potent compound. And second, that um, neural crest cell migration was the most sensitive endpoint test um, com in compared to, or compared from all the, the, the endpoints that have been tested so far. Or you can see that for certain compounds, um, the migration assay is much more sensitive than the other assays. And this was also kind of a hint that maybe um, there is a particular mechanism that is hit in the migration assay. And that could be a compound um, interesting for further uh, investigation. We can then see on the other side of the graph that here the potency in the migration assay overlays with the one from the TOX21 assays. And this is rather an indication that maybe we see here rather effects of general cytotoxicity so that we see migration inhibition just uh, at the border of or before onset of cytotoxicity. So these are maybe compounds that are not very specific migration inhibitors. And then here we also see have another interesting thing we can read from that graph is the ethyl silvestrol, so it's an, it has estrogenic activity. And you can see here that most um, TOX21 assays are in the higher micromolar range, but that there are two assays that are very, where the compound was very potent. And I would suspect that these are the estrogen, yeah, the, the assays that test for estrogenic activity. And you can see that the results from the migration assay are very far away from them. So I would believe that um, what we see, the effect we see in the migration assay is somehow specific or interesting because it's more potent than other TOX21 assays, but that it's also not um, the estrogenic activity of the compound that induces the effect on migration because then I would expect to happen it at lower concentration. So I think by comparing the data one can um, get some valuable additional information too. We then um, went on and did um, several follow-up assays. So as I've said before, the first one was to repeat the migration assay um, under the presence of a proliferation inhibitor. So it's called ROC. And so this is the corresponding control. If you omit ROC, you get higher viability and higher migration, which makes sense because there are a bit more cells. And so we tested all the compounds at the EC90 of viability. And you can see that for most compounds, we still see migration inhibition. But here there are three compounds that are problematic ones. So actually the effect on migration vanishes. So we cannot be sure that they are true migration inhibitors. Maybe the effect we saw in the, in the first assay was due to proliferation inhibition. But all in all, we can say that most compounds also worked um, in the absence of proliferation. We then performed the second type of follow-up assay. So we performed a completely different migration assay. So we decided to test um, a transvel assay. So in this assay, cells are seated on the upper part of a transvel membrane insert and on the lower part of the chamber um, a chemoattractant is placed in our case this was cetal bovine serum 
and within six hours the cells migrate through the porous membrane to the other side and they can then be um, stained, fixed and counted. So here is a picture from the lower membrane side and all the blue dots are actually the migrated cells and we can count them. But because we did not have um, used this assay before, we first had also to calibrate it using known positive and negative controls. So here is um, the untreated control basically, so no toxicant. And you can see here that if we omit fetal bovine serum from the lower compartments, we basically don't get any transfer migration. Then here you can see three endpoint specific controls, so compounds that interfere with the cytoskeleton and they strongly reduced migration. We also tested unspecific compounds. We knew from the steaming assay, we saw that they can slightly reduce transfer migration. And based on these compounds, we set a threshold for migration inhibition at 75%. And we then could now test our neurocrest cell migration inhibitors. And we found that several Compounds did reduce transfer migration, but not all. For example, retinoic acid here did not reduce. But all in all, we can say we have set up the assay and we can now use it for testing the seed compounds from the screening. So we tested all the compounds, and surprisingly, we found that all green heads um, reduce transfer migration. And so we can say that all kids are confirmed in this transfer migration assay. We also performed the third follow-up assay where we did manual cell tracking. So we basically repeated the seeming assay, but incubated the plates during the toxicant treatment phase in a live cell chamber and microscope um, and took pictures every 10 minutes. And after that tracked manually certain single cells. And if we graphically represent the cell tracks, we can see here that untreated cells migrate not very direction, directional, but um, around um, one millimeter in 24 hours. And if we treat uh, the cells with a migration inhibitor, they travel shorter distances. We then tested um, again the screen hit but we reduced it a bit and from very similar, chemically very similar compounds, we only tested one of them to reduce the workload. So what you can see here is actually that only three compounds strongly decreased cell speed. So this was DDT, heptachlor, and hexachlorophane. And then we have some more compounds that reduced um, cell speed a little bit like BPDP, PBDA, so, but for several compounds, for many compounds, we did not see any effect on single cell speed. And this was actually first a bit uh, surprising. So we started to think, how can this happen? Why can different migration assay lead to different results? And I will try to explain it to you using this scheme. So if we have here a normal situation and six neurocrest cells that all migrate at an average speed of let's say 1000 micrometer per day. This is what we consider as 100% in the steaming assay and the transfer migration assay. We could now have the situation that we have a toxicant that completely immobilizes 50% of the cells but doesn't affect the other 50% of the cells. In this case, we would see a reduction in the seeming assay by around 50% and in the transfer assay, also 50% reduction because the immobile cells would not be able to cross the membrane. However, in the cell tracking assay, we would rather see more or less a normal um, cell speed because we, the assay is rather focused on um, mobile cells. However, we could also have a different toxicant um, that reduces cell speed of all cells by 50%. In that case, we would see in the seeming assay a reduction by about 
but we would not see an effect in the transfer assay, maybe because um, the, the membrane is very thin and if the cells manage in these six hours to travel this short distance, then they will appear on the other side and be counted. However, in this scenario, um, the cell tracking assay should um, give us a reduced cell speed. So actually different assays capture different biological processes. And so, which processes are actually measured by our migration assays? So, we actually think that neurocrest cell function can be divided in several tasks. So, neurocrest cells differentiate, proliferate, migrate, can die, and um, perform signaling. We actually believe that our standard seeming assay measures migration, but also a part, part proliferation and some cell death. If we repeat the assay uh, under the presence of a proliferation inhibitor, we can omit this, um, this part of proliferation and measure only migration together with some cell death. However, migration is not one single process, but it's actually a very complex process that consists of um, different tasks or different aspects. For example, it's involves the distance that a cell travels, the directionality, or also cell adhesion is important. And we actually believe that with the cell tracking assay, we measure rather the distance a cell travels and maybe continuity. But that with the transvel assay, we rather measure cell motility and cell adhesion and some polarity and sensing events. And this explains why our different migration assay can give different results. So I would say that different assays give complementary information. So as um, one of the last slide, I would just uh, quickly summarize the results of the screening again. So we've seen 23 out of 75 compounds were positive. There were many flame retardants, several pesticides and few drug-like compounds. Um, in the seeming assay, we saw that few compounds had very strong effects and they were actually also consistent in the seeming assay on the proliferation inhibition and in the cell tracking assay. We saw that a few compounds were not effective when we repeated the assay under proliferation inhibition and that all compounds were confirmed in the transvel assay, but in also only very few compounds affected um, cell speed. And when we have a short look on the potency of the compounds, we found that two compounds are very potent in the nanomolar range, but most of the compounds were effective between one and 10 micromolar, so rather high concentrations. If I conclude the screening part, um, I would say that the assay is in principle suitable for screening. We found new migration inhibiting compounds that disturb neurocrest cell migration, and especially organochlorine and organophosphorus compounds. We could confirm all compounds in other migration assays, but unfortunately, we still have very little mechanistic information of what actually happens. And this is now um, the last slide that summarizes um, the entire talk. So um, I prepared some take home messages. So if you perform an essay development, keep in mind to use appropriate positive and negative controls to set up your essay. Be aware um, of possible confounding factors. In my case, this was proliferation. And Remember that different assays measure different processes. And so um, think about what, which process is actually measured by your assay. It's not always trivial. Um, if you perform a screening, keep in mind that hit confirmation is important. Also, the screening worked quite well in our case. We had three um, false positive compounds that we could eliminate in the hit confirmation phase. And we performed follow-up essays. They can give additional information, complementary information. 
Uh, with this, I am at the end of my talk. I'd like to thank you for your attention and my co-workers from the group of Marcel Leif um, for helping me with um, experiments. And of course, also, I would like to thank my supervisor, Marcel Leif. Okay, thank you so much, Johanna. That was a, a great talk. I, uh, I was really looking forward to it from the paper and uh, I, I really liked what you guys have done, um, what you have done in your work. Um, thank you. We have uh, opportunity for questions. You can either raise your hand, if you can see in the little control panel, uh, a little a little hand signal to raise, or you can type a question into the question box. And uh, while people are doing that, maybe I'll ask a question myself. Um, do, I I'm wondering, you know, this this uh, set of assays is sort of for uh, developmental neurotoxicity, and so I'm just curious about how you see the assays fitting into a larger strategy for thinking about maybe regulatory assessment of, of chemicals. Have you thought about that? Yeah, right, actually. Yeah, I thought about it because I'm writing my thesis, so I have to think about this kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the essay is quite in an early state, I would say. So it's now since three, four years that we developed it. So we don't, yeah, it has not yet been broadly tested. So for example, it lacks um, interlab comparison. We don't know whether the assay also works in different labs. Mm -hmm. It's transferable because the cells need um, quite some expertise. So to obtain the cells, that is actually the critical point. Um, regarding the throughput, um, I would say the problem is, for example, that the assay cannot be scaled down a lot. We use 96 well plates. One could maybe go down to 348 well plates, but I don't think one can go down further because the cells just need space to migrate. Yeah. And so this is kind of limiting the throughput a bit. Um, and in my eyes, actually, the the most, or from my knowledge, the most advanced. Um, Essay is the new right outgrowth essay, and so of course we are not not yet at that stage, and we are probably also never able to have that throughput. But I think it's quite promising to be used in certain test strategies. But it will, of course, not be the very high throughput essay. So I think um, first one would run other essays that are higher throughput, and only then move on to the neural crest cell migration essay. I would also see it in a test battery, of course, with other um, neurotoxicity assays or developmental toxicity assays. I don't think it can stand alone. Mm -hmm. Also think to involve, include um, proliferation as a separate readout, because as I've said in the introduction, that proliferation um, inhibition can, can also lead to disorders. I mean, that, that's known from in vivo data. So, yeah, there is still a way to go, but I I think it's promising to include it at some point in a in a test battery, maybe. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we uh, I don't see anyone with any questions or hands raised, so I think we'll go ahead and end the program. Uh, thanks again for your presentation for taking the time to prepare it and give it. And thanks to everyone listening for, for listening. You uh, should have received emails from me when you registered. And so that's uh, my email. You can contact me if you have any questions further or if you, you know, would like to learn more about the ASCCT. Thanks very much and have a great day.